All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. Um, I would like to say thank you all for joining in um, today. Uh, my name is Lakesh Sharma. I'm a BMP coordinator. Um, thank you, Dr. Mike, for your uh, help and support for this uh, conference and uh, some beautiful ideas how to uh, organize this. Uh, thank you, Catherine uh, Holland, for this idea of uh, uh, mini grant conference. Uh, I think this would be a great, uh, a great platform for many agents and uh, some other agency folks to learn what we are doing and uh, uh, what kind of projects are uh, are important for uh, Office of Ag Water Policy BMP mini grant uh, program. Uh, with that, uh, I would say. Uh, uh, Thank you to all speakers for agreeing to speak. And uh, uh, every speaker would have uh, between 12 to 13 minutes for presentation and, and two to three minutes for question answer. Uh, Dr. Michael Dukes would be uh, moderating uh, today's session. And uh, um, uh, I, uh, we will just follow the agenda for, uh, for the uh, presenters uh, to come and present. Uh, I think we have around roughly two hours to complete this conference. So uh, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can wait till the end of uh, that presenter to finish the presentation and, and ask the question. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Michael Dukes, uh, uh, could you help uh, moving this conference forward? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to make sure before we get started that we've got a couple people from FDAX. Oh, okay. Catherine just texted me. Maybe that's who the other Michael Dukes is. That's weird in many ways. But anyway, uh, very good. Well, we will go on and get started. Thanks, Lakesh, for doing uh, all the legwork, Emily, for logistics and uh, welcome everyone. Lakesh, I'm just gonna go down the list that you had prepared for the agenda, is that good? Okay, very good. Well, our first presenter is Dr. Wendy Mussolini. Uh, is that right, Wendy, or is it Mussolini? Mussolini. Okay, all right. I was, going with, I was going with the Italian <laughs> flair, you know? Mussolini, no, not, not exactly. Uh, Anyway, Wendy's gonna uh, talk to us about maximizing phosphorus availability for potato production. And the we, we have a 15 minute slot. So I'm gonna, I'll let you know when you're getting close to the 15 minutes. If we don't have time to um, address all the questions, put your questions in the chat and we can follow up with speakers afterwards to get your questions addressed. So Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I think this this is a great idea from Dr. Sharma to be able to share our projects. You know, this is uh, actually first or second time I've actually been involved in a BMP mini grant, and um, it's great to be able to share among the camaraderie with other folks and see what other folks are doing. So thank you, Dr. Sharma, for putting this together. I'm looking forward to next year. I'm more excited about my work that I'm doing this year than I was last year. So <laughs> Anyway, I got to do some phosphorus work in potato production, and so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a background on what what's going on. And uh, I work I'm I work primarily in the Tri County area, which is Putnam, Flagler, and uh, our Hastings farm is actually in St. Johns County. Um, and so a lot of my growers are potato growers, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of background of what's going on. I don't know how many of you are familiar with. Um, some of the stuff going on with, okay, so for some reason I can't go down. Let me see. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Let me share a different screen. Try to put it in mode there. Okay, so now I can go down. So, okay, so the phosphorus fertilizer application for potatoes. Um, currently, we do um, tests for phosphorus in the soil before we apply it, obviously. And so, if we test the soil 
We always run Malik 3 here in Florida. So if I send my uh, samples off to Waters, I have to tell Waters in Georgia, hey, make sure you run a Malik 3 extraction method for phosphorus. And the current, this is based on our EDA stock. You can see the, um, the publication at the bottom of the page. Um, if, it's, if phosphorus comes back greater than 45, it's considered high. 26 to 45, it's considered medium or low, less than 25. And the IFAS recommended rate is if you have high phosphorus in your soil is zero. Medium, you can add 60 pounds per acre and, and if it's low, 120. And then there is this beloved footnote uh, that's part of that EDIS document that says, well, potatoes that are planted in cool soils might respond to 25 pounds of phosphorus added as, as a starter, as a pre-plant fertilizer, um, putting it in with the seed pieces. So uh, where, where that footnote came from, we're not exactly sure, but it is part of the, the, um, the EDA stock that we go by. And so, um, so rather than a true zero rate, um, we, we, can consider a 25 pound rate, even if the phosphorus is considered high. Now, um, the problem with that is that our growers are accustomed to adding 100 pounds of phosphorus because that's just what they've done for many years. And the problem comes into play because the regulators say, well, you know, IFAS only says you need none or zero if it's, if it's high and the growers are still adding more. And so now that FDAX is starting to come out every two years to the fa potato farms, they say, okay, well, you're, you're not doing things appropriately. So there's some, some issues going on there. Dr. Liu has done a lot of work on, in this area. And we did, I worked with him very closely. We did a lot of soil sampling. We did a lot of work for from 2018 to 2020. We worked on potato um, chip farms and table stock farms. And we did full trials, like 10 to 12 acres on each farm and we compared harvest shields, we did different rates of 0, 50, and 100. The problem here is that most of the soil samples that we collected, matter of fact, all of them looked a lot like this page where you can see the phosphorus is in the high range, okay? 76 is above 45, so it's high. So the recommended rate, anytime it's high, which you can tell all of our farms that we worked with all had phosphorus concentrations in the high range. So all of them were considered zero. So I'm not going to go into a lot of work about the results on that because it wasn't my work. That was Dr. Liu's work. But I'm going to tell you that this, this phosphorus is, is certainly a conundrum. It's a confusing and a difficult problem or question. Why do we need to add phosphorus um, to potatoes? I think some of the reasons are that potato crops do have a, a low root density when you compare to other crops like corn or um, some of the bigger uh, row crops. Their planting season is in January. Soil P is low. Um, it's in that, you know, the bioavailability bio of that nutrient is low in the cool soils. Um, you have lots of aluminum and iron in the soils. And at that soil pH range between five and six, there's a possibility of binding that up. You're fumigating every year. Potato growers out there are fumigating every year. So they're killing everything in the soil. So there's no opportunity for microbes to actually break down that, that nutrient and make it more available to the plant. This was a picture um, that actually Dr. Liu found in one of his, um, about showing the potato, um, potato root system compared to maize. Um, and just you can see how, how much smaller that root system is. Here's some pictures I have taken of some of the roots and, that I've harvested in my trial. So this is what I got money to do this last year was to do a half acre trial using chip potatoes. We did this work in Hastings. We did a randomized complete block design, which means it's replicated four times and nine different treatments and they're all randomly located. And this bottom picture is an actual picture of the plot map that we used. So you can see, you know, each treatment is in block one is you've got one through nine and then in block two, you've got one through nine. And so but it, these, the order is random just so you can deal with the, the variability across the field. Some, some parts of the field might be a little wetter, some might be a little drier, depending on how the irrigation works. Um, so we try to eliminate that variability by doing replicated trials. We did different 
uh, phosphorus rates. We did 0, 50, 100, 150, and 200. Um, 0, 50, and 100, you know, those are the rates that are focused on for the IFAS recommendation, right? If it's low, you can add 120. If it's medium, you can add 60, something like that. So these are the three rates that are important. We also looked at, well, what if we added phosphorus over four split applications? rather than just one time at the very beginning of the trial when we were planting the seed, which is common, that's what most of the growers do, put it all out at one time. Let's try to put it out four different times and see if the availability is, is better for, for the plant uptake. Um, so we planted the potatoes, we harvested the potatoes, we took soil samples every week, we took tissue samples uh, a couple times, we actually took root samples at the very end. And a little video, in case you've never seen people plant potatoes. This is actually at our 4-H potato field day, I think. That's why I took that video. We have the kids come out and teach them how, to, how we plant potatoes mechanically. Uh, these are the results for each of the trials. And the first set of box plots um, from here, zero to 200, uh, those represent the one application the one full application of phosphorus. And these over here to the right represent the four split applications. And I just want you to, I don't want need you to look real closely at this, but, but just to understand you can see that the four split applications are generally the trend is a little bit lower than these. Let's get into the statistics. Um, when you compare the statistical differences for the P rate, what we found was we, we looked at marketable tuber yield, which are, a, you know, A's, A1s, A2s, A3s, we grade all of those out at harvest time and we combine those harvest uh, marketable yield and we come up with this, this, this number over here on the y-axis is, for example, 200, um, that's 100 pound weight per acre. That's what you, you, you kind of report potatoes in. So 200 represents actually 20,000 pounds of potatoes per acre. Um, but they, they just go in hundred weights. That's how they talk about potatoes. So when, when we look at these results, we see that uh, the, the main differences statistically are that the 150 pound rate um, was not different than 100 or 200, but it was statistically different than the zero in the 50 pound rate um, when we looked at the rate. Now we also looked at the statistical significance of those number of applications. And just as you saw in that first box plot, you see that the four, when we applied it four times over the course of the growing season, it was statistically lower than when we put out one square application. And this was something that we, this was part of the, the real root of, of the project. Is this approach even viable? Even though it's not really realistic in terms of asking a grower to go out four times and spread phosphorus, is it even worth their time and consideration based on what we consider the reasoning of why the phosphorus is, is not as available to the plants as it, as it should be with that much phosphorus in the soil. So this was really important to see a significant difference here with the ones. And, and, and honestly, um, our main conclusion was that the highest marketable yields were observed at 100, 150 and 200 pounds per acre. Um, and then the significant differences were between the 150 compared to the zero and the 50 pound rate. Um, but that one complete phosphorus application of five before planting produced significantly higher yields than the four split over the first 50 days of the growing season. So that's my presentation. I have a lot of people to thank for this. Um, Hastings staff, obviously they planted everything, maintained everything, helped me with the harvest. Yeah, you know, they put everything in place to allow this trial to, to, to happen. Dr. Shauna as the lead PI in all of this. Dr. Liu and I work very closely. His grad students came out and helped me. Um, Dr. Lucinde helped with statistics and um, finance department organized all the finance and FDAX gave us the money. So just want to give everyone a shout out and thanks for the help on this. Are there any questions? Or do I have time for questions? Yep, we have... Uh three minutes or so for questions. And uh, I'm glad you clarified that uh, the, the numbers for, for P were, are actually P205, right? Throughout. Yeah, okay. yeah. P205, that was clearly in the... You know, yeah, Wendy, uh, Stuart, Stuart uh, 
well, you had a 200 hundred weight was, uh, you know, your your high yield. Uh, what is the commercial average in Hastings? <laughs> Probably on a good year, 350 to 400. But the, the growers always tell us that we're a research station and we can't grow potatoes as good as they can. <laughs> Well, that's probably true. <laughs> so, well, I don't argue with them. But yeah, normally they grow on a good year. They're getting, you know, when weather conditions are right, 350. If they're getting 400 pounds, uh, 100 weights, they're doing real good. They're, they're making lots of money at 400. Any other questions? Got a couple minutes. All right, well, well, we'll move on to the next speaker. And if you think of a question, put it in the chat. We can always come back to Wendy. Wendy, I assume you're gonna be here for a little while. I'm gonna stick it out through the whole- Awesome, thing. very good. See what everybody else- So if a question comes up, we'll come, we can come back to you then a little bit later on. All right, well, without further ado, our next speaker is Libby Johnson, who I, I this is a surprise appearance. Libby, I thought you weren't gonna be able to make it. So uh, I'm glad you're here. And uh, Libby's going to talk about cover crops. Of course, you're glad I'm here, Dr. Dukes. I mean, you don't have to say it. I know this already. 110%. Okay. So, uh, can ahead, I just Libby. say that Wendy Mussolini killed it with her presentation because she shows data and all sorts of great things. I'm talking to you all about on farm stuff. That's pretty, pretty basic, I think. But, like, thanks for your, your, your great presentation, Wendy. So, um, I generally seem to do a lot of soil moisture stuff up here in the panhandle because. That's our biggest things with row crops because we don't have a whole lot of irrigation systems. I see that Ethan Carter's on this too. He has more irrigation systems than I do. So he's probably not as worried as I am, but cover crops tends to be what we try to do up here in the panhandle. Um, let's see if I can get this to move for us guys. So how do we deal with moisture situations here? How do we manage soil moisture? I mean, we do have some irrigation systems uh, in Escambia, not really so much, but irrigation really is expensive to install. It's expensive to run. Uh, people want to buy potatoes and spend money on potatoes. People don't really want to spend a whole lot of money on cotton clothes. I mean, if you really think about how much you spend on cotton, it's not really that, that, that big a deal for you guys. Um, the farmers say the best way to pay for irrigation is to not use it because then you're not really having to run the cost of the electricity or the fuel, however you're getting through it. So that's probably the best way to pay for any kind of irrigation we have. Um, and our farmers here tend to have issues with timing their uh, irrigation between rainfall events because we're never really quite sure, just like everywhere else in the state of Florida, we're never understanding when the rain may or may not come. So that can be a, a, a problem with us. And there is some kind of limited control for some of the farmers to get some of this done. So um, it breaks down a lot. I, I see a picture that's a research station picture of them trying to fix an irrigation system right there. There's always something going wrong with them, it seems up here. So how do we manage irrigation or soil moisture up here in the panhandle? Um, we want to reduce the evaporation part of the ET equation. Uh, so to get less moisture getting off of the, the crops uh, through that way. We want plants to of course transpire, but we don't want the soils to evaporate. So we do tend to do a lot with trying to put cover crops down. And all y'all are probably thinking like, man, everybody uses cover crops. Well, we're not always so fond of it in the panel. We, we do some, but there's a lot of regular fallow uh, out here. And I've had a number of farmers discuss with me about it's too expensive to put a cover crops in. It just doesn't make any sense. It's just, we don't want to do this. Um, but then I get to talking about this next question. What is an inch of rainfall worth during a drought? And it never fails. Like our rain systems up here, we're usually able to get crops planted in, in late April, early May, but then it turns it turns dry in, in late May and turns dry in June for us, for the most part. Um, so just having some extra moisture when we can is a huge event for those little plants that are starting to come up. All my project, by the way, is on cotton. So, uh, and cotton is pretty drought, drought stress efficient, like it can deal with a lot of dryness, but it still needs some, especially when it's, when it's blooming and doing things like that. Um, we always worry about the time between termination and planting of the crop. So terminating the actual cover crop, because I mean, we have stuff growing throughout the winter time here, but then we have to kill it. We have to burn it down at some point to be able to plant the next crop. So farmers tend to worry about like, how long do I really have to wait? Because if you kill your cover crop too late 
and try to start planting it, it just keeps sucking the moisture out. You have to time it at the right interval so that we has time to dry and just kind of lay on the ground for a little bit. So with this project that FDAX helped cover and FDAX continues to help cover stuff up here in the panhandle with this, it's to utilize winter cover crops and dryland farmland to demonstrate an improvement on soil moisture to profitably grow the summer cash crops. Seems so basic compared to yours, Wendy. All right, so some of the cover crops that we use generally up here is oats. We use a lot of oats, especially because we can keep the oat seed. A lot of farmers have grain bins. They cut oats, they store their oats, and then they replant the oats again come the next winter time or, or late fall. Um, we grow rye, and for us, 401 rye is fantastic. It's a wonderful uh, type of rye to grow because it grows tall. You're going to see a picture of uh, Scott Walker, one of the most lovely men in the whole wide world, standing as tall as he is. Um, we do grow some rye grass, especially with people that are growing a cover crop with livestock because cows love them some rye grass. Usually they'll plant a, a mixture of oats and rye grass if they can, because that gets them early and late planting. Um, and we also use tillage radish. That's the picture you see on the right-hand side uh, and sun hemp after corn. So we usually will plant the, uh, a mixture sometimes of tillage radish and sun hemp. The sun hemp dies when there's a frost but I mean, it grows really tall after cutting corn in, in August and by the time November. And we didn't get our first freeze here really late till just, gosh, I think it, it finally froze at the beginning of January here, which was really late for us. So it had a lot of time to kind of grow here. So it's a beautiful crop. I'm going to go ahead and say that tillage radish is a beautiful crop. And when that stuff starts to die, it stinks to almighty. I'm trying to think of a nice word. It stinks pretty badly because that tillage radish. Oh, brother. All right. So this, I kind of talked to you a little bit about this, a great use of cover crops, especially up in the panhandle. And Ethan, once again, is here, could talk about a lot of the stuff that's being done in Jackson and Calhoun County with incorporating livestock with cover crops. This is a fantastic practice to do because, of course, you get a, a great cover crop on there. The cattle graze and put a lot of nitrogen down um, through, through their own excrement. And that really helps build up the soil over the, a few years. Um, and a lot of farmers really kind of like planting after they have cattle in their situation because it, it does tend to hold a lot of moisture. The problem, once again, is that getting the cows moved off because, I mean, we're just a stalker. Those are just stalkers. They have to go somewhere. We have to get them sold and then to terminate the cover crop to get it planted. I don't know how many people on here are livestock people. I'm not really a livestock person, but anyway, so the project that we did with Scott Walker, he's off to the right hand side and Scott's taller than I am. And for him, this is crazy for him to have uh, this type of 401 rye for him. So Scott and Sam, Sam's his daddy, they don't plant any cover crops. They never have. They don't have any, any kind of equipment to do it. Um, they don't really know how to manage it. So uh, it was kind of a little bit of an unusual project for them, I would say. They do have cousins in Baldwin County in, in Alabama that are doing this. And when I talked to them about the project, they were all on board about doing this because they've seen the success next door. So we did plant for a ride there this last year. This year we have, um, oh brother, triticale planted because I couldn't steal the 401 rye from the farmer I'd gotten it from the year before. So um, on the left-hand side, you see November 17th, that's when we're starting to plant it. And the guy on the left, uh, that's Mike Mulvaney out there with us, just kind of checking to make sure everything's running. And you see a guy on a tractor that belongs to, um, Greenpoint Ag, like a, a, a company up here, like it's a co-op portion, and they came run that equipment. I have all sorts of industry that help do this instead of getting farmers because, I mean, they're all planting stuff too. So we established uh, the triticale at 70 pounds per acre, and we planted into the dust. Like it was so dry when we planted it, and I, I kept praying to the goddess skinny punks that it would come up. But you see on November 27th, that's the little seedlings just starting to pop up, which we were thankful for. And then by mid-March, that right there, is, is, is Scott standing there with his his uh, his crop? We planted after peanuts, by the way. It's a, he has a peanut cot rotation. So we did a field day because the grant required us to do a field day, and we had on April twenty second. We were supposed to have it the week before, but we got a rainfall event. If y'all can know, and once again, Ethan's here. We had rainfall events all last summer. This was the worst year to do a cover crop project ever because it rained all the time. We got more than 25 inches probably during the growing season. I'm not kidding, more than 25 inches during the growing season. So terrible year, sorry FDAX, I'm not, sorry you're hearing all this. Well, to get the probes out, we, we planted six, three strips with cover, three strips with no cover. 
and we installed probes in all six strips to do a comparison of cover versus non-cover. Well, when it dries out like this, because he did a burn down off the case, you see Scott over there having to dig this stuff out. He had sprayed glyphosate over the top of it. A poor boy had to take his, his shovel and try to start digging the things out. Um, and then the middle picture shows uh, a piece of equipment from KMC, uh, Kelly Manufacturing Company. They brought it down and they, they fit it to the right. They plan on 38 inch spacings, the walkers do. So they made sure all the things were right. And basically that rolled down the cotton and they it cut a little furrow to be able to plant directly um, the cotton into it. And you can see on the right hand side, um, and we have a graduate student, I have a mask with a graduate student, I like to point that out, I want extra points. Just checking to see how the planting was going. Right here we have, uh, we did plant in mid-May and it was, you can see Scott and uh, Kip Balcom, not Scott, I'm sorry, that Mike Mulvaney, Kip Balcom, he's from Alabama, it's a multi-state project. And on the right, you can see right there, the cotton just starting to kind of, that's, the, that's not even real leaves, there's just cotyledons coming up. So uh, I did want to show some of the, soil moisture sensor um, data that we got. And I just did the eight inch depth because, I mean, that's that's kind of the first level we're looking at, just to show you all the difference in, in how much uh, was in the rye versus the bare ground. The top solid line is how much moisture was generally found uh, where, where the rye was and the bare ground was a lot less. However, in a normal year, usually the differences are a lot bigger, but it rains so much. So all the little lines at the bottom, the square things, those are rainfall events. That's not what you want to see when you do a dry land project. And it kept on throughout this, the rest of the summer. Uh, I also did 16 inch, still see all the rainfall and not as big a difference because we had all that rainfall. So we did harvest uh, the cotton on November 19th and um, we just took a, a cotton, a seed data, seed cotton data. Um, he has of course run it through the gin and stuff. We could get that information for you. I don't have it yet. We use 443 cotton, which um, it's, a, it's a three gene type of cotton. And he did it uh, with a reniform resistance in this particular field because he believes on the right hand side, when you look on the, the field, this, the, the monitor on the right, you can see how it's kind of orange and yellow. He does have worse yields over there. And so that why, that's why he did a, a reniform resistant cotton in that particular field. You can see also on the right hand side, like some different reds and, and purples. You don't want those, those are bad yields. Um, and those are represent where he bogged down because once again, it rains so much over here. We had farmers that installed tracks on their, their sprayers because it was so wet to try to spray peanuts. But you can see the yields for the, the six different uh, plots. And yes, there was a difference, but is it really enough to make a difference financially for him to have planted it? No, no, it's not. Uh, early on results demonstrate, did improve the soil moisture in covered areas, and greater penetration of moisture in the profile. But over the long run, this is also Mickey Diamonds, another guy in Santa Rosa. It makes more of a difference probably for Mickey because he got a little bit less rain. But over for Sam and Scott, it probably didn't make enough of a difference for them to buy the equipment because they don't have any of this stuff already. And I see I only have four minutes left. Michael Dukes, I'm gonna stay on time, my brother. I stay on time. Um, I want y'all to see on the right-hand side, that's what triticale looks like when it's rolled down. It just rolls down so nice and flat and beautiful. It's easy to cut a little furrow in there and plant your stuff. It's a fantastic cover to plant in too. Like it keeps all sorts of weeds down. Mickey, who also is doing a dry land versus cover crop project that we work on with FDAX as well. He loves using, um, he loves using the 401 rye but it's expensive compared to oats. He thinks he's probably gonna go back to oats if he can, but I'm sorry, that I think I told you I was triticula. That's really a 401 rye there. He has I've spent a lot less money on herbicides in that because you really can't get weeds coming up very easy in that particular stuff. And so to stay on time, I like to end with why use cover? So this is a picture from Santa Rosa County. Um, and actually we're planting cotton in that field, like where we planted cotton in, in Mickey's. This is what happens in Santa Rosa County come May. Like the wind blows and it knocks all the dust off and you're standing out there getting dusted out. And so is everybody that lives around there. Now it's not a very populated area, but nobody likes this. I would like to say, and I don't know if EFTA actually really wants to hear this, but homeowners don't really love 401 rye homeowners around because when it produces a lot of pollen, it blows like nobody's business everywhere. So I don't think they really particularly love it, but the farmers really like it. It's just, it's more expensive. And once again, I usually still 
uh, for one rye from, from Mickey, but he got in big totes this year. And I couldn't think of a way to steal a seed from him. So that's why we did Triticale this, this coming year. Um, and I like that, Wendy, I didn't include that, included a cover of who she had to thank. Of course, I have to say thanks to Sot and, and Sam and, um, and Nikki Diamond and to KMC and to Greenpoint Ag and to FDAX. I'm particularly thankful that we have a lot of industry that supports this up here. Of course, they want to sell cover and they want to sell cover that requires fertilizer up here, but they're also very, very helpful in doing all this type of stuff with us. So that's my presentation. Thank you all for having me. Michael Dukes, what do you want to tell me? Great job. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Michael Dukes. You did a great job, Wendy Mussolini. Um, I, I would say uh, we don't have any questions in the chat, but uh, Yvette is giving you a uh, virtual round of applause. Okay. Um, so, you know, it was a wet year, but what do you think would have happened if it had been a normal year or even a dry year? Hopefully we're going to see that this year because Scott has planted his stuff again uh, in December. So we're hoping that we see a big difference in yield. I should have gone back to it and just sh shown more on the yield monitor because like as we would progress, we would talk about stuff and being with the farmer and talking to him about the project, I think is so valuable for me. Like I have learned so much from Scott and Scott has learned it from me. So um, he's really hopeful that eventually it will show a big difference. Right in the field across, he has irrigation. So, and we have run projects over there. So, um, I mean, he has seen just how the soil moisture sensors work and be, being able to better uh, understand his uh, irrigation methods, but he's really hoping he doesn't have to irrigate so much. So I think he'd rather have cover out there than, than have to irrigate. So Great. that's it. Have and I'm on time. Thank you guys. Is the questions over? I'd uh, like to yeah, we're kind of moving on, but you have a quick one, Wendy? Yeah, about the content of the clay in the soil. I'm just wondering how much you guys have up there compared to our little sandy stuff we have down we here. Could so y'all don't know the guy, uh, he used to be in Jackson County and he would say y'all could take our soil and fertilize it everywhere else in Florida. We have a lot of clay, a lot of clay, it cracks open. Like compared to the rest of Florida, we have a lot of clay, not like in Louisiana. I mean, but we have a lot more than you guys do. Okay. It's great soil. Yeah, I'm just thinking y'all would have seen a lot of differences had you been in our sandy soil by doing that same type of project in a sandy soil that we're in versus your clay that holds so well. Yeah. That blows away though. We still have sand and stuff. Anyway, but thank you guys. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Libby. Hi guys. We're gonna move on to our next speaker and um, Emily's gonna put up a set of pre questions. We're gonna pre and post questions for you to uh, like a quick poll. Uh, our next speaker is Dee Broughton who is gonna talk about uh, corn and watermelon nutrient management wood control release fertilizer. So if you would take a minute and select your choices for answers on the poll. Give that a couple seconds as Dee is pulling up her presentation. All right, Dee, okay. you ready to go? Ready? Yeah, so right. <clears throat> thank you all for letting me speak. Um, just wanted to mention that um, my review, the results that I'm gonna give today come from my work and Bob's work on controlled release fertilizer for uh, corn and watermelon. This was one of the regional, regional projects and uh, there were a team of folks involved. Um, so special thanks before I get started to on the left, um, all of the, the agency people, the farmers, I, mean, I hope I didn't leave anyone out. And then on the, the right hand side, agents, extension agents, staff members. So it's kind of um, broad reaching and um, covered a couple of different crops. So hopefully Bob will chime in if I get something on the melon side wrong. But to kind of outline <clears throat> the issue and uh, over here in the Swanee River Valley, we're focused on nitrogen. And so um, I highlighted corn because that's the biggest acreage and the biggest potential impact if we could reduce at least 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, we're trying to get to a $4.1 million pound, 
not dollars, 4.1 million pound reduction in nitrogen in the basin um, in upcoming years. And so we just uh, thought that this has an objective to get growers to find ways to reduce uh, specifically with controlled release fertilizer could lead to, to adoption of this BMP tool, fertility tool, but also um, help help with that overall um, as the ultimate goal. But what is controlled control release fertilizer? Many of you all may know, but some may not know like why we're even looking into this. It is definitely not a slow release fertilizer, um, whereas that would be pretty much a disaster in our climate if um, it released based on moisture. Um, the unpredictability and the rainfall that we have. Uh, so a lot of people call it that, but it's not a slow release fertilizer. It's released based on temperature, not moisture. And the coating is customized. The thickness of the coating is customized based on um, temperature trends over time and the growth cycle of a crop growing degree days, the season, uh, all sorts of things like that, but based and centered around temperature. So this is a very high quality product, very expensive, uh, but in bold, it could be very important in protecting nitrogen from being vulnerable to leaching, especially earlier in the season uh, when before the root system is really strong and established, it could help, um, you know, growers are still having to, to, to do what they need to do in order to get uh, fertilizer out and they're using irrigation systems and pumping a lot of nitrogen specifically on corn. Um, and a lot of it could be lost early in the season. So uh, we are interested and have been, uh, and growers are also becoming more interested in learning more about it. Um, more pressure, increased environmental regulatory climate is, you know, growers are asking more questions, you know, with all of these acronyms um, that are coming across um, in conversations and visits that they're getting from their FDAX representative um, record keeping and NAR forms and all, all of those sorts of things. I'm not going to go through the list, but our growers here kind of have a long-standing history of BMP adoption to some degree or another, so it's not new. And um, so many of them are willing to, to look at, at new and different things. And now with the heightened pressure from these, um, these new things, growers are, are willing to, to try things. Production efficiency is another key that uh, fewer tri trips across the field, um, not using irrigation systems like Libby said, less fuel, less wear and tear on equipment, on um, electricity costs. Um, if you just put something out there one time and leave it, um, then there's advantages to that for sure in terms of all of those costs. Uh, crop is being, the, it's being spoon fed. Um, so if it releases small amounts over time, that would be ideal for um, um, fertil fertilization crop use efficiency of fertilizers and nutrients. There's a potential cost uh, for the cost to level out. So for corn, um, there's a history of projects that have taken place, small plots and on-farm trials, many of them over the past three years. Um, in 2021, most of everything was, everything with controlled release to my knowledge here on corn was on farms. Um, we chose farms specifically under this project that were targeted areas. Um, um, the term is priority focus area. They, the Dixie County one, for example, is near Rock Bluff. You could just go through those woods and the spring would be there. And so uh, very environmentally sensitive areas. So we targeted those growers in those areas. Um, but some points to know just why are we doing this? Their current method uh, is that they're using over overhead irrigation pivots to broadcast most of their liquid nitrate nitrogen to the corn crop. Um, and growers are having, it's, it's not the most efficient way of getting it out when corn is a few inches tall all the way, um, you know, up to, you know, harvest or prior to harvest would be when they stop injecting even after tassel. So a lot of them are getting out over 300 pounds of in. Um, <clears throat> and so for the trial, producers agreed to reduce their amounts to target 250 pounds uh, so that we could show them that you can reduce and we can use this, this form um, and grow similar yields. Some of the equipment um, that we used to apply, this was a first products banding rig um, with double disc openers. So it laid the fertilizer in a little furrow about four inches to the side. 
Um, it was protected there, didn't run off. So um, that approach has worked. It's just, we need bigger and more options, I think for some of our larger scale farmers, but um, the concept is, and how it works is, is there. We collected a lot of data on this plant tissue samples. Um, we looked, we installed moisture sensors and made observations throughout the season. Um, one of the key aspects of this for FDAX and, and for us as well was to monitor the nitrate nitrogen uh, leaching that or availability where it was in the root zone uh, and compare it to the grower standard, the conventional neighboring field with the controlled release field and, and see if some had passed beyond the 36 inch depth and where it was. So we did this weekly and was able to kind of Look at, look at that over time. So this is what one of the farms looked like, the grower standard compared to the controlled release um, a week or so before harvest. Um, and the ears you can see look very comparable, just random, random ears. Um, I'm gonna try to move quickly to get to melon. So um, I just wanna mention, don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but that the average yield for irrigated grain corn is 200 to 220 bushels per acre on any given year. And so just depending on inputs, you know, it could be a little bit less or it could be, you know, over depending on management, but within that range is a decent average yield. And then for silage, it's 25 to 27 tons per acre. So looking at the differences here between the controlled release and the grower standard, um, it's, it, I think that we had a success. Uh, when you look back at the average yield, uh, there's all sorts of economics and things that we need to evaluate better, but overall it performs well and we know it's comparable. Um, with watermelon, a uh, similar thing, like um, years of research, small plots, Bob has been doing work on farms with different growers. And then in 21, this, this opportunity allowed us both and Bob to get on farm and, and do three farms uh, with the controlled release. And so some of the equipment that he would use um, is here. And Bob can chime in anytime if he's able, uh, but the, the applicator that was used, it drops the fertilizer uh, where the right in the bed, and then it's covered with plastic, get the bed moist, it stays there for a period of time until they plant to, to prepare for transplant. So if you had a conventional fertilizer that's water soluble and you have to keep it moist for a period of time, you can imagine, um, you know, what might happen to that fertilizer. So it's really uh, a good option for watermelons in terms of um, keeping it in the root zone and not letting it, you know, pass by the root zone before the transplants get there. So here are bigger, uh, better pictures of, of the augers that we used for the multi-depth sampling. That's Alex McMillan in the middle who was helping Bob. Morgan Morrow is, um, looks like she's installing a moisture sensor. And these guys did this, the same thing with watermelons that we did with corn, um, collect dry leaf um, tissue, tissues for analysis, uh, petiole sap testing, um, and the multi-depth nitrate uh, soil tests, soil sampling. Uh, these guys and the extension agents, you see Mark Warren, the Levy Dixie agent there, um, they actually uh, cut the melons and did their own uh, yields, me yield measurements for the final outcome. And from my limited experience, I know that 60,000 pounds of watermelons is really good. Um, and you can see the results here, the total yield for one farmer being 73,000. Uh, 166. And there's, a, there's scenarios around all of these, and I wish I had more time to explain and to talk about, um, you know, some of these farmers did apply supplemental uh, allowance, depending on the situation. Um, same with corn, but there were some that did not. Um, and, and so overall, even with a little bit more nitrogen, there were still less on my end than the totals. Um, but that told us something as well, that maybe, you um, Maybe, maybe manipulating it that way, just as you would with your nitrate nitrogen. Um, but then if you have a weather event, um, you, there, may, there may be a mitigating um, circumstance where you could and need to apply a little bit more, but certainly not over 300. So those are the, the, the sorts of things. And I, I think I've just said in a nutshell what this slide says, um, and just just also from Bob and, and, and my experience with this, that any fertilizer program 
must be used in conjunction with good irrigation management. Um, and, and there's different scenarios surrounding that from our experiences with growers and their styles of irrigating and, um, and managing input. So that's very important. Moving forward, um, uh, we know that controlled release fertilizer is more expensive pound for pound. Uh, we know how well it's performing and we know the potential that it has and how the technology is evolving and changing and, and, and better and better every year from our experiences. Um, so should the added cost of CRF temporarily be shared by the public by a cost share program to incentivize, by, incentivize the practice? Um, growers are asking for this, they're curious. Um, there's reasons economically and uh, environmentally, but but also uh, a peace of mind and knowing that it's there, you know. And these different things may happen, but but it's it's there and it's going to do. There's a there's a level of trust built up, I think. So um, it's a question that we have, and how can we incentivize the use of it for potential wide, widespread adoption? There's other crops that are more higher value. Uh, snap beans, carrots, potatoes. We didn't mention those and we didn't study those in this. It was only watermelon and corn. Um, but I mean, there may be situations that, that where growers may be more willing to pay outright for the product. But I think we need to focus on our bigger crops and where the impact is in terms of um, nitrogen loss uh, to our water sources. And I think that those crops may need a, may need a little bit of help. Um, so I don't have anything else unless Bob, if he's still on and had a comment or question, I think I'm out of time, but thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dee. Bob, you wanna say yeah, anything? I, no, I think she's done a really, really good job with it and don't really have anything to add. Good job, Dee. Uh, I think the bottom line for both of these crops is we've, we feel comfortable that we've learned how we can use controlled release fertilizer, especially looking at uh, nitrogen and, um, and feel like we've, we've learned a lot to help growers uh, introduce that, that BMP if they choose to. Question D and or Bob, what, what are we talking about in terms of a, a cost differential? Are we talking, is it $10 an acre? Is it $50 an acre? Is it $100 an acre? Give us a feel for ballpark. Well, a year ago, I might would have been able to answer that a little more confidently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it was, I would say, you know, Bob might have a different response, but somewhere between 150 to 200, depending on their conventional source and what company you're purchasing um, the controlled release with. So somewhere in that range would be the differential. Wow, that's a lot. Now, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and of course, now we know fertilizer prices across the border up. So who knows? Yeah. Okay, uh, any questions? We've got one minute. Mike, if there are no questions, I'll just maybe make a comment to follow up here with it. You know, we, we don't have anything formally worked out. We have had discussions with both the Water Management District and DACS about, you know, how do we incentivize things moving forward? And I think it gets to be really tricky in separating out the coding from the fertilizer itself and the optics of a cost share program that somehow is, is, is incentivized by farmers paying for fertilizer. So I think that's the next hurdle that we're gonna to need to get over. But in some cases, there's, there's, this, there's situations, especially watermelon fertilizer under the bed. I don't know how else we're gonna be able to solve it if we don't move to some other, some other practice. So I'm hoping that we can do some things in the future to help incentivize these growers to try some of these practices. That's it. Great. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Dee. Appreciate it. Uh, next up is Caitlin Bainham and or Carissa Wickens. I'm not sure who's actually presenting. Uh, and they are going to talk about establishing uh, perennial peanut in Bahia grass for horse farms. So the pre-survey is up. So I think I saw Caitlin turn camera on and she's going to start to share. So hit the, hit the poll. Caitlin, let's, as you're getting ready, let's give them a, maybe 10 or 15 more seconds for the poll. Okay. And then we'll, we'll go ahead. That's a pretty picture. Thank you. I can't take credit for it, but I thought it was pretty too. Okay. 
All right, Caitlin, why don't you go ahead and launch into your presentation? Okay, and I think Dr. Wickens, I actually know she's on here too. So Carissa, yeah. whenever you want to chime in, feel free to do so. I don't see you on my screen, but I know you're there. So she's, um, she's there or someone with her name's there, but there's like six <laughs> Michael Dukes's. So who knows what's going on? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Caitlin. I'm here. Um, I think I might, um, as we discussed, I might help with the objective slide just to kind of introduce some of the the why and, and, and what we wanted to do. So Perfect. when I get to that slide, I can help in. Okay, so um, this particular project focuses on um, establishing perennial peanut into bahia grass on horse farms. So um, wouldn't be the Marion County agent if I didn't bring up horses. Um, so here we go. So a little bit of background. Um, this is kind of a Florida statement, but certainly here in Marion County, um, horses are making an increasing mark on our pasture land. Uh, many people that maybe once were transient horse owners coming down here for the winter are now moving here full time. And with the World Equestrian Center and all sorts of things, and even down further in South Florida, we have a lot of um, folks, even if they are here for part of the year, um, buying land here and therefore learning how to manage uh, their pasture here that often is much different from wherever they're coming from. And with that, we all are aware that there's a need for improved water quality through getting these horse farm owners to adopt, well, first of all, become aware of, then adopt and, and implement these BMPs on their farms. Most of those having to do somewhat with pasture management and then a big thing that I deal with, um, with my equine clientele is they, first of all, wanna ask what are their options for horse grass down here? Um, because they're very concerned with quality or what their perception of forage quality is. And I get the fun answer of telling them they don't really have any options. You get, you get one and it's behavior grass. Um, so that doesn't always go over so well, but it is what it is. So working with that on maybe exploring some other potential options, if they're a little bit more advanced and ready to take on something like perennial peanut. Um, and then, you know, we have limitations with obviously our warm season forage types that are going to persist and persist under grazing. So there's a lot of questions um, there and not a ton of work looking at grazing other warm season perennial forages outside of Bahia grass when it comes to horses. So all of these things at play. So perennial peanut is I mean, some of us call it the alfalfa of the South, even though now I know they're starting to look at alfalfa actually in the South, but still not really on an on-farm basis or a grazing basis. So perennial peanut has a little bit more history as far as maybe being used in those realms. And it's a legume forage, which is important when we're talking about BMPs and trying to maybe fix some nitrogen in these pasture systems over time, understanding or getting our clientele to understand this doesn't happen um, in the first year, the first few years maybe, but over time this could be really beneficial in reducing the need for commercial fertilizer applications. Um, and it can work well with our Bahia grass as it's another warm season perennial. And it kind of hits that topic that they're interested in as it does as a legume, it's just naturally gonna have a higher nutritional value than our Bahia grass. So it hits some of the high points for, for some of our horse audience. Um, but management maybe could be tricky. So I will let Carissa kind of explain the background of this project and some of the main objectives that we're looking at. So go ahead, Carissa. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, so good morning, everybody, or at almost afternoon now. Um, so yeah, this, this is actually, this was an opportunity for Caitlin and I, and we also have some, some additional collaborators. Um, we certainly are consulting Dr. Jose Dubé and um, Tim Wilson, um, St. John's County agent is also involved in this project. So this was an opportunity to continue to work in this area and build on an existing, almost reaching its end point project that is also funded through FDAC's Office of Ag Water Policy, a larger project that my PhD student and I over the last three years have embarked on to look at incorporation of rhizomal peanut into existing Bahia grass pastures as, as a grazable forage for horses. Um, we, we do have producers that feed perennial peanut hay. Um, we know horses like it, but in terms of both acceptability and also you know, forage quality, forage response to grazing by horses, 
we haven't really investigated that yet with rhizomal peanut. Um, so we already have some existing data and wanted to really build on the demonstration and education aspect of this project. So as part of the larger FDAX grant um, that we were awarded a few years ago, we already established two cooperator farm sites where we are establishing rhizomal peanut in two acre plots on each of these facilities. But we really didn't, we weren't going to have the funding going forward through that project to look at some other measures. And so we wanted to be able to utilize the mini grant to really focus in more on the demonstration education side with field days um, at the two sites. But moreover, this was an opportunity to get some resources and equipment to look at things like biological nitrogen fixation, um, soil moisture, so that we could actually look at maybe what influence this is starting to have on water holding capacity and some other measures. Um, so the mini grant is helping supplement and, and help us to continue this project. So again, the goal is to establish two demo sites of perennial peanut. We're going to strip plant that into existing Bahia grass for um, two horse properties, two horse facilities. And then, um, you know, really using that as an educational opportunity to introduce this idea to horse owners. Um, one of the things we're finding is that even when we're talking about this with horse owners, there's still just not a lot of awareness of fresh perennial peanut as a pasture forage, as Caitlin mentioned, but also implementation and actual establishment is proving kind of difficult for some of these producers because a lot of our smaller acreage horse facilities don't even have the equipment or certainly the know-how to, to do this. Um, so really proof of concept here is what we're going for. Um, so then again, the overall objective, once we have this established and we've got these sites um, up and running, we're going to be looking at forage mass, biological nitrogen fixation, soil moisture, and water holding capacity. Thank you, Carissa. So um, unlike a few of our other counterparts that have already gone, this project, um, we're a little bit behind because as we all know in science and weather, things don't always cooperate. So our intention was to have the peanut sprigged this past summer, um, but we ran into some hiccups with actually getting the material dug with um, all of the crazy rain and weather patterns that didn't make it conducive, conducive to getting that material to us. So then we've opted um, to do what we kind of prefer anyways, which is planting it um, here in just a few weeks. So we prefer to kind of do that winter planting versus the summer planting. So um, we've since planted some cool season forage demo plots to hold over the areas and have some additional field days. Um, but basically our method, like Carissa mentioned, is we have our two farm sites that are two acres each that we've alternated with strips of um, 10 foot tilled prepared areas that we will plant the peanut into. And so we've tested the soil and we've done some already um, amendment to um, alter pH um, to these sites. And we've done some burn down herbicide with glyphosate. We've tilled a couple times um, because as you can see in this particular site, this is my Marion County site. It was a run down Bahia grass pasture at best. So we've been doing a lot of improvement, not just in getting the strips prepared for the peanut, but also in those Bahia grass strips. So um, there's been a lot of prep work and land prep that's gone into this. So we have pushed the planting until um, winter of this year, so here in a few weeks, and we've done some cool season annuals to hold this over. So our expected outcomes, Carissa basically touched on this, our site cooperators um, have agreed to host our educational events. So we have a land prep plot walk slash check out the cool season forages plot walk planned here in Marion County and also in St. John's County with Tim Wilson um, here in a couple of weeks. So we're going to get that going. And then we're, our idea is to kind of um, get people interested from the start bring them along through establishment and continue these plot walks and these field days to hopefully um, build their confidence that, you know, with some training and expertise and at least hiring the right people that have the equipment um, and, and giving this forage ample time to establish, they too can put perennial peanut on their horse farms if they have enough space to dedicate to that. Um, and then hopefully over time, we'll be able to gain some more data on some of the, the things Carissa mentioned um, and, and maybe even hone in more on the nutritional aspect with the horses, but that will be in subsequent years. So Chris, is there anything final you want to add? I know we don't have any um, real data to present on this. This is kind of an ongoing thing that we already got pushed back from the summer. So we are playing catch up just a little bit. 
Yeah, um, that's thank you very much, Caitlin. I, I think the only thing to add maybe is, again, just very appreciative that these projects are kind of building on each other and it really is helping us do the outreach component of, of the project. Um, some of the grazing work that we did do um, summer of 2019 and summer 2020, uh, that was my PhD student, Carol Vasco. We did find that perennial peanut in two acre plots with two mature horses grazing it was fairly persistent. Um, it, it maintained about 29% of the vegetative cover throughout the, the grazing season. So that was horses on these paddocks from basically end of June, early July through the first week of October. Um, we are still, we still have a little bit of data um, that we're working on right now, like with some biomarkers from the horses to look at the nutritional response of the horses to the, to the forage. Um, but really we were seeing some good positive results. And of course the big thing here is incorporating that legume, we are reducing reliance on that commercial fertilizer application um, and just keeping better healthy stands of forage. Um, we, did, we did have a little bit better weed control in those intercropped pastures. So thank you very much. Thanks, Caitlin and Carissa. Um, and uh, you know, I think we've heard, we heard from Libby and we may hear it from some others. Uh, thanks for sticking with this. You know, last year was uh, hashtag Rainsville in, in our neck of the woods, right? You know, uh, half, something like 100% or 50% more than normal rainfall during just a three month period in the summertime. So, uh, so keep, keep at it. I do have a question though, as people are, uh, doing the poll and thinking of questions. Have y'all ever thought about, or has anybody thought about, per particularly in Florida, it just occurred to me that if we could move to perennial peanut for a, a pasture, it may offset a significant amount of uh, alfalfa that's trucked in from Wyoming and Idaho. I mean, you've got a huge carbon impact. You've got issues these days with supply chain. There aren't enough trucks to take all the stuff everywhere. Any thoughts on that? I think that's a a great thing to strive for and while that's probably certainly feasible it's more so the marketing the idea to horse people that this right. is a thing that perennial peanut is a similar quality or can be um, people just are less familiar with it overall and so I think it's more of a marketing the idea to them more so than the science actually being there that it's it's a positive thing. I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think in terms of because there is a heavy reliance. And again, I think some of it is Caitlin and I actually just gave a talk earlier this morning for a group. You know, we talk about our transient horse folks and people from other regions of the country that move their horses down to Florida. Sometimes the only legume they, they know of is alfalfa. But even from an environmental impact side, when they're, you know, feeding alfalfa, if we can have perennial peanut, at least during the summer grazing season, it maybe has potential even for some of those young growing horses or those brood mares that have higher nutrient requirements without having you know, a, a little bit less of a nitrogen footprint. And that's a little bit what we're finding, at least in terms of when we feed it as hay versus you know, harvested alfalfa. So that gives us some nitrogen reduction in addition to just cost savings for horse owners. Um, you know, incorporating that into pasture systems could at least for a few months during the year save them from having to, to have more off-farm nitrogen inputs. They have to feed less grain, less hay. So that would be fantastic. Very cool. And uh, as you know, I have some knowledge of the horse world and uh, my wife used to feed peanut to her horses and liked it a lot, but now we get alfalfa because that's what's available where we're at. So anyway, thank you both. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move along to our next speaker, who is Ethan Carter. Ethan is going to talk to us about hands-on training about soil mapping and nitrogen calibration strips in row crops. Ethan, the floor is yours, but why don't we wait a few seconds and let people hit the pre-survey, um, maybe 10 or 15 seconds more. And just to reiterate, if anyone has questions, you think of something you know, from two speakers ago, put it in the chat. And um, I think we're gonna have time at the end to hit on some of those. So on the first slide here, I, I have the title Dr. Dukes mentioned, but I also have our team. So I, I wanted to recognize all of them. I believe most of you probably know them in some shape or fashion. Uh, you, you've heard from Dee, you're also gonna hear from Jay. Uh, so I know a number of them are on here. I've done a, a quick swipe through, but uh, 
we'll see, you know, as y'all have questions, as we go through, let us know. And if it's not something I can do off the cuff, I do have a team uh, and I put faces to the names. Very good. All right, Ethan, floor is yours. All right. So our situation here, let me see how I've got y'all. Uh, so situation and purpose. So just a little bit of background over the last 50 years, uh, our crop yields have gone up, but so has our fertilizer use. And this project, we're talking specifically about nitrogen. Libby's mini grant, she talked about cotton. So that's what I'm going to talk about as well. Uh, so with nitrogen use, you know, surface water, groundwater contamination becomes an issue especially with ammonium forms, you know, that's readily converted to nitrate because it's so leachable. Um, different fields, different areas need different amounts of fertilizer. You know, we, we soil test, we grid sample, we know that. Uh, so to account for some of that spatial variability, you know, soil mapping is an important tool that we have to help you determine rates for a field. All right, so that's where a varus unit would come into play. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about as well as some nitrogen calibration strips, that bottom bullet point there, that we did in different zones and different fields to see you know, what nitrogen rate worked best, all right? And so I'm up in Jackson County, Florida. Uh, we had several trial locations, I'll show you here in a minute, but they were all in the panhandle. The objectives of our grant were to educate growers on these different precision ag tools and try to long-term minimize nitrogen inputs, you know, and therefore improve water quality without adversely influencing crop yield. So in Jackson County, where I am, we have the Blue Springs Basin. I don't need to tell the FDAX people that, uh, but I mean, all of the farmers, you know, they're very conscientious about the basin and what they need to do to try to reduce nitrogen loads. And so that plays right into hand with our mini grant. So again, the, the three tools that we were trying to talk about there in the middle, so we had the Ferris MSP3 equipment and its components, unmanned aerial vehicles, so drones, and then the nitrogen, nitrogen calibration strip. So these two pictures here are actually from our field day that was in Jackson County. Uh, we've got a bunch of pictures. Uh, I've tried to put a few in there, but you can see we had a pretty good turnout and we had the Varus rig running. It, it wasn't just talking about it. It was on site, it was being used, the drones were flown, the strips were there. I mean, we were showing these hands-on so people could see what was going on and also have tangible handouts that they could reference throughout the meeting and have later for themselves. So here we have the, the Varus equipment. So it tells you it's a tractor mounted piece of equipment with infrared sensor. It does soil organic matter. It has six electrical coulters. You can see those in the image and an automated pH meter. So we had people uh, this one was from the research station in Quincy, but we had people on site who offer these services that talked about it. You know, um, the unmanned aerial vehicle there, you can see the drone set up on the table. There were three drones. Uh, they flew those. They showed on a monitor what the drone imaging looks like. I have a picture here just to show y'all, you know, some sensory footage there that says untreated. So the drones can be used, you know, to help detect fertilizer problems, you know, yellowing or striping as well as disease issues, insect issues, precision ag. So our nitrogen calibration strips in CS, we establish those right after planting as soon as we can. Um, typically, well, we were using a range of rates, but typically the grower would tell us what he has done historically. And then we would use a lower rate, that rate and a higher rate and try to key in on what that field specifically needed based on our ranges. So. When I talked about the Varus mapping, that soil mapping is done by EC, all right, electrical conductivity. So you can see here we have an image from the Varus map. That data is put together. We have a darker zone and a light zone. So that's based on our ECs. The darker zone has a higher EC. The lighter zone has a lighter EC. So think of it as a heavier soil and a sandier or lighter soil, dark versus light. Uh, we did a number of different ratings from NDVI with sensory, visual quality, and leaf, leaf tissue analysis to help determine our in-season rate. So what we did with these, north, with these nitrogen calibration strips, we had small strips, 15 to 20 feet long or adequate, all right, to put out all of these rate ranges, monitor them to see how the field responded, 
And then at bloom is when we did our in-season nitrogen rate, okay? And so those strips, this is one field, the bullfrog field in Jackson County. It's called bullfrog because the road you can see there says bullfrog road. Um, those strips in this field were large. So they were six rows and they were 600 feet long. But our actual calibration strips were just 15 to 20 feet. That's what we keyed in. And then we use that infield rate there at flower. So I mentioned we had several locations in the panhandle. All of them were irrigated except for our Monticello or our Jefferson County sites. So we started with five locations, you know, dream big. We ended up with four. Um, one of them in Monticello had an issue with emergence. So, you know, a, a dry land, non-irrigated field, emergence was a problem. We had, you know, some cotton plants that was up and high, some that were emerging. Um, soil content, clay content also played a role in that. So at the end, we ended up with three Jackson County locations and one in Jefferson, all right? So the three Jackson were all irrigated. You can see we've got planting dates on there when we put out our strip establishment. And then you can see the harvest date as well. So again, all of this was cotton. I don't have a lot of quantitative data, but at the end, I do have a yield slide I want to show y'all um, and another table as well, all right? So here's some images from our Jefferson Field Day. Again, we had very good attendance pulling in from neighboring counties and that host county. Um, unfortunately, you, you see my title says Jefferson Field Day, but we're inside. It was storming, raining cats and dogs all day, and we were chased from the field to the extension office. Um, but I mean, you always have a backup plan and you keep rolling. So we had some presentations that were done on the, on the screen there. We had all of our handouts that we had used at the previous field day so people could see the handouts and hold something. And we just rolled with the punches. Here's a couple of our handouts just zoomed in. All right. So, you know, what is a nitrogen calibration strip? How do you use it? What does that various EC map look like? Um, you know, using a drone and understanding how that works. Uh, of course, when we're talking nitrogen studies, nitrogen rates, growth management becomes a huge topic in cotton. And so we had a, a presentation and some information on that as well. These are just the first couple of page or the first page of each of these handouts. So think of each of these handouts as being three to four pages. All right. This isn't all of it, just what I'm showing you guys. Um, and I'm I'm trying to go without being too fast. So again, if there's something you have a question on, you know, slow me down or, or ask in the chat. We'll get to that here shortly. Um, so a, a summary from our field day and our meetings. Across our two field days, we had 50 people attend. So we were extremely proud of that. I mean, these were what I'm going to call a pop-up field day. So it's not an annual event that people expect and they know about. It was something we had to promote. We had to let people know what was going on and they were genuinely interested. And I mean, you can see we had farmers, industry, and anyone with an acronym. I mean, if they were in the alphabet soup, we had them. Um, and it, it worked out very well because there was a lot of discussion, you know, facilitated through these events. So we talked about and educated them on the various equipment, its mapping abilities, the need for, you know, judicial nitrogen use and cotton uh, growth regulators. And then we also talked about, you know, the use of drone imagery and that sensory data, how it can be used. Um, besides the handouts, I have a YouTube video link here. It's about nine minutes. I'm not going to click it, but I know this is being recorded. Or if you want us to send it to you, we can send that to you. But that's an in-depth explanation of the Varus rig, all right? The Varus rig is there in the video as it's being discussed. So my last two slides here uh, are late season data that we collected, all right? So you can see each of our locations irrigated, the one non-dry land. Um, you can see what I really want to pick out, and Libby talked about this in her presentation, was integrating livestock, right? Grazing. So we have a column that says winter grazing. No, 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 no. You get to the Monticello location. Yes, there was winter grazing. It was non-irrigated. And then if you look at the nitrogen strips in those last two columns, so I mean, 84 units and 67, all of those others are 100, 200 plus. All right, and so EC plays a large role in that. Again, this is year one of our data, so I mean, uh, our EC, you know, being low or high, sandier soil versus heavier soil, 
And, and just having that animal integration really helped here um, from our first year's viewpoint, all right? So we'll see if that continues to hold. This was yield data from two locations. So the first map I showed you was from the bullfrog field. That's our uh, chart on the left with the blue and yellow bars. The chart on the right is the Alford place that had those very low units um, from the previous slide, all right? And you can see that at the bottom where it says control 31 units. Uh, and then on the left control is 58 units. So our left-hand graph is showing the blue is our dark zone in the trial and the yellow is our light zone. The map on the right is only showing the light zone, all right? Uh, but if what I want you to key in on here is I mentioned 31 and 58. If you look at the yields, so that 31 units on the far right side, yield is over 1,200 pounds. If you look on the left map for the same light type of zone, nitrogen is 58, so it's nearly doubled, and the, year's about, the yield is about 900 pounds. So we're seeing over 300 pound yield difference there. So it's really interesting to look at these. And I mean, all of our nitrogen strips, you know, they vary based on our ECs um, and what the grower applied rates were. So with that, I'm back to our team here. I've got everybody's picture. And if you have any questions, I'll attempt to answer them. And hopefully some of my team will chime in if they have something to say as well. Any questions um, for Ethan? Um, Michael, I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Um, Ethan, uh, so you mentioned that you have had uh, a calibration strain. Uh, my question is um, you have, uh, had an algorithm out beforehand to go for the calibration strips or you are doing all this in one? Okay, I'm still unmuted. Sorry, I was looking for my little thing. So uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking if we had preliminary data moving into this or if we did it all in field on site. Is that right? So the the typical uh, the typical uh, format for using NDVI uh, as an in-season uh, nitrogen management tool is uh, you do a rate study for a couple of years or a few years, you develop an algorithm, and once you have an algorithm, you come up with a uh, high rate nitrogen strip, uh, and that will determine your uh, um, nitrogen for normal feed. Uh, right. So you have so you folks developed this algorithm before uh, starting this study, or you are doing as the study is moving. So a little of both. This has grown out of some visual data that's been done at Quincy the last couple of years. So Dr. Ian Small, I didn't have him on our our list there of co PIs, but Dr. Ian Small was the one doing the drone work. All right, so uh, or it using that drone work data. And so they were doing the greenness strips and they were, you know, like you said, they, there's something they have from the past that they've done in Quincy, but what we were doing in field was the first time at those field locations. So we were going off of, you know, the fertilizer we put out at planting, how are the plants responding, which seems the most green for, you know, what we expect from that rate, uh, the most reasonable rate. And then our at bloom was based off of that. So a combination of the greenness the visual observations and leaf tissue that was pulled. Okay. Oh. Uh, if I can, uh, if I can add uh, to to this, uh, the way we set up our uh, calibration strips and the way we we determined the in season end rate was uh, that close to blooming, we would go in with. Uh, we were also flying drones to capture NDVI, but we also had our handheld meters, and we were looking to hit the plateau. Uh, so for, when we were moving from the lower rates to the higher rates, uh, we would get a, uh, with the incremental increase in nitrogen in the strip, we'll get, we'll get a higher NDVI rating up, up until to a rate. And after that, our NDVI rating would plateau. So the point at which we plateau was considered as the, the, the best rate for, for that particular- Hi, Anna, uh, this is Anna Prezia, how are you? For that particular year. Um, I got, I got it. So you folks are using a response index, or uh, uh, are you using in-season estimation of yield? Um, 
Yeah. I'm just curious. Did, did I answer your question, Mikesh? And no, I asked we're, if we're kind of out of time. I think we'll probably have to take the Q and A offline. Sure, sure. You, I think you all know each other, right? So we can figure out a time. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ethan. Appreciate it. We're going to move along in the interest of time. Our next speaker is Jay Capasso, and he's going to talk about facilitating adoption of BMPs through on-farm trials. So Jay, Everybody hear me okay? Yep, can hear you. Go ahead and get your presentation pulled up and we've got your pre-questionnaire, uh, the pre-poll out right now. Okay, great. Everybody see my first slide? Yep. Okay. Let's, let's give it 10 seconds, Jay, for people to do the poll and then we'll launch right into it. Sounds good. Okay, so I'll get started here. Yep. So I'm going to be talking about my um, best management uh, mini grant projects from the 2021 season and talking about control release fertilizer in field corn in North Florida. And I'm Jay Capasso, I'm the row crop agent with U of IFAS Columbia County Extension. I'd also like to thank my co PIs, Dr. Lakesh Sharma of the Soil and Water Sciences Department, Chrissy Fletcher of St. John's County Extension and Paulette Tomlinson of Columbia County Extension. So in these trials, in these first couple of slides, if you saw the 2021 BMP Summit, you might be familiar with them, but I wanted to pro provide an overview kind of what these trials are trying to accomplish. And we compared various application methods of control release fertilizer to grower standard practices, which generally involves broadcasting conventional fertilizer. The goals of the control release fertilizer trials were to promote BMP practices, such as the use of side dressing or banding, which is a more efficient fertilizer application method than broadcasting, and the use of soil moisture sensors as well. We also wanted to evaluate the use of control release fertilizer on field corn. And to do so, we compared yield, uh, nutrient tissue sample analysis, soil nitrate data uh, between uh, control release fertilizer treatments, either banded, broadcasted, or side dressed, and I'll get into that in the next slide, and the grower standard practice, which generally involves broadcasting conventional fertilizer, either dry fertilizer or through the pivot as well. So you see in the first picture here, you have a side dressing rig, a first product rig, moving between rows of young corn plants. And then in the second picture on the right-hand side, you can see the control release fertilizer, which uh, Dee Broughton commented on earlier. It's release dependent on temperature. Um, and so I'll move forward to the next slide. So these are the different fertilizer applicators that we use. You have a broadcasting rig over here on the left. And the broadcasting rig can carry a good amount of fertilizer at once. You can see that it's carrying control release fertilizer. And this uniformly spreads fertilizer throughout the whole field. And growers prefer to use this just because it's a fast and easy fertilizer application method. However, it can be inefficient just because it's uniformly applying fertilizer. It's not trying to get fertilizer close to the corn root plants or corn root roots. You have a side dressing rig in the middle here. This is a four row first product side dressing rig. And each of these hoppers can carry about 1200 pounds of fertilizer. So, if you have a small acreage, that's not really a problem, but if you have much larger acreage, that can be an issue because you know, only being able to carry a little over a ton of fertilizer at a time, you're gonna have to continually refill this side dressing rig. And side dressing rigs are made for split applications of fertilizer. When we're applying control release fertilizer, we're applying a starter at the beginning of the season, and then we're applying the rest of the fertilizer for the entire season for the field corn. So with, with larger acreages, we've found that some growers don't like using the side dressing rig just because they have to continually refill it. So Harold's, which is a brand of control release fertilizer that we use for this trial, uh, they developed their own banding rig and it drops fertilizer on top of the row. It doesn't incorporate the fertilizer down to three inches or so like a side dressing rig does, but it would drop fertilizer on top of the row. It's common to go back and try to strip till it in to try to incorporate it with the soil. But in this case, we, um, 
we basically came back and just planted over it with the planter. But it can carry about 5.5 tons of fertilizer at once. So that's the, the benefit of this rig for larger acreages. You don't have to continually refill it. So some of the pros and cons of banding controllers fertilizer. Banding is a more efficient fertilizer application method than broadcasting. When you band fertilizer or side dress, you pro probably apply about 30% less fertilizer just because you're placing that fertilizer more efficiently near the, the corn plants. Control release fertilizer can be applied in a single application along with the starter at the beginning of the season. There's a higher cost to control release fertilizer, which is the main barrier that's preventing growers from adopting it. However, it, it, it does incentivize efficient application methods. It's beneficial for growers who are unable to center to fertigate through the center pivot. So I have a grower that's using hard hose irrigation. So he's not able to get over the corn plants after they reach a certain height. So after about 40 days, he's unable to apply any more fertilizer. So it's beneficial that it stays around longer than conventional fertilizer in those type kind of situations. Some of the cons of control release fertilizer is that it takes longer to side dress compared to broadcasting. There are fertilizer applicator capacity issues for larger acreages, and there's a higher cost of control release fertilizer. So these are the three different grower cooperators that I worked with. I have grower cooperator one in Columbia County, who's under hard hose irrigation. And the treatments we compared were side dressing control release fertilizer to side dressing conventional fertilizer. We have grower cooperator two in Columbia County, who's a silage producer. And he was using center pivot irrigation, which is probably more representative of your typical Swanee Valley farmer under uh, center pivot irrigation. And the fertilizer treatments compared on his farm were broadcasting conventional fertilizer, broadcasting control release fertilizer, and banding control release fertilizer using that Harold's uh, applicator rig that I showed you earlier. And then grower cooperator three was in St. John's County, and he's under seepage irrigation. He's very close to the uh, St. John's River over there. And his fertilizer treatments that we compared were banding control release fertilizer, broadcasting control release fertilizer, and uh, broadcasting conventional fertilizer. So I'm gonna jump into the yield results for grower one. We've worked with this grower for a number of years now. We had a, a, worked with him on comparing broadcasting conventional fertilizer to side dressing control release fertilizer during the 2019 and 2020 season. And at the beginning of the 2021 season, he pursued cost share to get his own side dressing rig. So in this trial, we compared side dressing control release fertilizer to side dressing conventional fertilizer. And you'll see that in the first table here, we had pretty low yield results. And that's due to this guy down here. He's a maize weevil and they get into corn. And I always thought they were a storage type kind of issue, but they can get into corn kind of later in the season and it eats the corn out basically from the inside. It gets into the kernels. And they really decimated that field. So we went back into field six, which is what uh, table two shows. And we sampled from that field as well, just because we figured that was more representative of what was going on because there are less maize weevils in that field. And you see, if you run a t-test on this, you won't find any significant differences. It's very close um, in both fields. And we found similar yield results with um, field six and table two kind of showing probably more likely what the grower would receive without that maize weevil issue. And this is the picture of the, the corn that's infected with maize weevil. You can see that they drill holes into the corn and they can be quite the problem. This was a benefit of conducting the trial. We were able to advise the grower. We found the, the pest when we were out um, harvesting the corn to you know, compare yields for the trial. And we were able to advise the grower on what kind of fumigant options to use for the storage process. These are some of the soil nitrate data. We collected soils from zero through six inches, six through 12 inches, 12 through 24 inches, and 24 through 36 inches. And you can see the side dress control release fertilizer treatment and the side dress conventional fertilizer treatment in the right hand corner with, um, oh, sorry, with nitrate on the y axis and sampling dates on the x axis. So basically, we had one application with the starter of the side dress control release fertilizer and basically in mid-April. And with the side dress conventional fertilizer, we had 
just the starter was put down in mid-April around planting. And then we had an application of side dress conventional fertilizer at 30 days and then at 40 days. So he's trying to get that fertilizer out before he can't get over the corn any longer, which is basically at 40 days. Moving on to grower two, we had a number of problems um, in grower two's field, but I think this is the field we learned the most from. The first issue we ran into was fertilizer placement in terms of the banding rig. These are twin row uh, corn, and you can see in the left-hand corner, we've got the control release fertilizer perfectly applied between the middle of the two rows, two twin rows. And then in the right-hand picture, you can see that we were off slightly. So the placement was basically to the left of one of the twin rows. So we ran into a little bit of issues with this. We also ran into an issue that the starter fertilizer that the grower used had very little nitrogen in it. And we had a very cold beginning of April. As you learn from D, the control release fertilizer releases nutrients dependent on temperature. So we were, in, we were seeing nutrient deficiencies in the beginning of the season. And we also had Zane Grabau of the Nematology and Entomology Department out to the field and we were able to identify symptoms of nematodes as well on the corn. And we found them in soil test results as well at high levels. So we ran into a number of problems with this trial in terms of you know, the pressure from the starter fertilizer and the nematodes and placement issues. And we didn't only run into placement issues with the uh, banded control release fertilizer, we also had it with uh, broadcasting treatments as well. If you see this drone image, the left-hand side of this pivot, you can see streaks in the field and it looked like a roller coaster ride. The corn would be higher and there would be lower, higher and then lower. And we ran into issues just with fertilizer spreading issue as well. So I've never seen that with a side dressing rig. With a side dressing rig, you get the fertilizer down at three inches and it stays there. So I'm hoping to be able to get a side dressing rig out to this grower's field next year. And I'm hoping to be able to show him basically the corn that I've seen with the side dressing rig is very uniform. And we did not have yield results from grower two. They, were, they harvested very quickly throughout the field um, doing the silage corn and uh, did not notify us in time. So we were unable to collect yield results. We did collect soil nitrate results, but we only had three samplings before the funding cut off uh, back in June. So this is grower three yield results. This is a grower in St. John's County. We had two replicates of each treatment, the broadcast control release fertilizer treatment, the banded control release fertilizer treatment, and the grower standard treatment. We found very similar yield results in the banding and broadcasting of the control release fertilizer. The grower standard treatment, it's important to note, had about 20 to 30 more pounds of nitrogen in it, while the broadcast and banded control release fertilizer treatments were roughly the same. And this is the soil nitrate data from grower three's field. You can see the, the banded control release fertilizer treatment. Then the, in the middle, you can see the broadcast control release fertilizer treatment, and then the grower standard treatment um, in the right-hand corner. Moving on to some of the extension impacts. So with grower one, we've been working with him for a number of years now, and the grower obtained cost share through on soil moisture sensors and on a side dressing rig through the Tuani River Water Management District. So he's implementing both of those practices on farm. I would call him a model grower in the Tuani Valley region. He's gone on film for me and advocated for the use of soil moisture sensors. Before he started using the soil moisture sensors, he was applying about one inch of irrigation for every irrigation event. Now he, now he applies closer to about 0.6 inches of irrigation. So that's a 40% reduction in, in water. And you also have to imagine that the soil moisture sensor helps him determine when to apply irrigation water a little bit more efficiently. For his efforts, he, was, he received a This Farm Cares Award um, in 2021 from Florida Farm Bureau as recognition. And as part of this project, we released that video of him you know, speaking about the soil moisture sensors along with uh, Libby Schmidt of the Swanee River Water Management District who talked about available cost share at the Water Management District. We have a grower two was definitely a learning opportunity on fertilizer placement, both for broadcasting fertilizer and for uh, banding fertilizer. 
We also learned that, you know, you can't have a starter fertilizer that has a very small amount of nitrogen, especially with a control release fertilizer. We found that nema uh, nematicide solutions for future plantings for this grower, we were able to find a nematicide that works for corn for him um, with his application equipment. And that will be good going forward. We don't like to run into situations where growers are trying to fertilize themselves, you know, out of a nematode problem. It's not a good situation to be in especially since you can't do much about nematodes after planting. And then with grower three, he adopted additional use or additional acreage of control release fertilizer on field corn. So I think even though control release fertilizer costs more, he liked it from a management point of view and um, he used that additional acreage. We had a meeting back in June. It was also supposed to have a field component, but I think we got rained out that day. And I can thank Dr. Defoe of the plant pathology department for taking this picture. We had about 20 attendees and it was a good opportunity for growers to learn to earn pesticide CDs. I'd like to thank my co-PIs, Dr. Lakesh Sharma, Chrissy Fletcher, Paulette Tomlinson, all the staff and faculty at the North Florida Research Education Center, Swanee Valley. Been very helpful ever since 2019 when we started these trials. Um, on getting out there, helping us use the um, side dressing equipment, helping us um, calibrate it. And special thanks to Joel Love, the DMP coordinator. I'd like to thank Dr. Zang Grabau, who, uh, who visited the field and helped us determine nematode issues, and Harold's fertilizer, especially former fertilizer rep Jay Steelman, and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, who funded these trials. Thanks, Jay. If everyone would fill the poll out, we are out of time and I think we'll move along. But if you have a question, as I said, put it in the chat and uh, we'll circle back around here in a few minutes. All right, so our next speaker is gonna be Yvette Goodeal. And she's going to talk about the soil moisture sensor network. Sorry, I was having trouble finding windows. Can you see, let's see, let me get to presentation view. We can see your PowerPoint. Is it in presentation view now? It is now, yes. Okay, good. All right. Let's let's give about 10 seconds for the uh, pre survey here. Okay. People are filling it out. All right, Yvette, the floor is yours and you're going to have is Lisa going to speak with you as well? Yes, Lisa and Sean. All right, so very good. Yeah. All right, so thank you. I'm uh, Yvette Goodeal. I'm an extension agent in Martin County. And um, as I just said, I'll be joined by Sean Steed and Lisa Hickey in sharing information about the progress that we are making in our statewide soil moisture sensor network. And we also wanna uh, thank Vivek Sharma um, for his input in this presentation. Okay, now if I could figure out how to forward. <laughs> How have other people been doing it? Let's see, right click. Now I'll do the right click thing next. Okay. All right. So first for me, it helps me to remind myself of why we are doing this. And one major reason is to help improve water quality. Um, the photo on the left shows a harmful algal bloom. These are causing major issues for the environment and the economy, as well as uh, risk to human health across the Treasure Coast where I live and work. Um, and the EPA reports that harmful algal blooms are a major problem across all 50 states. Looking at Florida as a whole, you can see in gray on the map pictured here, all the water bodies that do not meet state water quality standards. And much of our issues with water quality stem from nutrient pollution, um, pollutants are coming from many sources, one of which is agriculture, and water is a driver of nutrient pollution through runoff and leaching. So irrigation management is very important. 
And optimizing irrigation management can not only reduce nutrient pollution, it can also contribute to cost savings, water conservation, and better crop yields and quality. One of the tools that we have to optimize irrigation are soil moisture sensors. And we have many different types of sensors and they can be used in fruit tree crops, container nurseries, field grown vegetable crops and more. And our Florida BMPs encourage the use of soil moisture monitoring technology. And as we've heard, there's even cost share funding available to help growers um, make a purchase of the sensor equipment. Yet we don't have many growers here in Florida or elsewhere in the US using the technology. So how are uh, Florida farmers managing their irrigation? Well, most go by the condition of the crop and some are also considering you know, how the soil feels and using other methods. Only about 15% are using soil moisture sensors. And those, those visual and tactile methods that the farmers are using are very much of value and should not be set aside. Even with soil moisture technology, having that field verification of what the numbers is, are telling you is vital. So when we're introducing the sensors, we offer them as another piece of information to consider in making irrigation decisions. And as you can picture with introducing any new technology or practice, people are hesitant. Um, is this worth the money? Do I really have the time right now among all of my other priorities to research this new technology? Um, even if I liked a new technology, how am I gonna pay for it, manage it and fit it into my operation? And will it cause me any risk? So farmers have those same concerns and questions. They need to see the value of the technology. They need to recognize it as low risk and low effort and giving some uh, farmers some help getting started with the technology can really be a benefit. And through our soil moisture sensor network, we hope to address the barriers to soil moisture sensor adoption by giving farmers a low risk, low input means of trying out this new tool for their operation. But so is an extension network the best way to engage growers? Who do they turn to for information? Especially here in Florida, growers say that extension and universities are their most turned to source for information on water conservation practices. So they are turning to us and we need to be ready to provide them with the tools they need to know about. And this is what we are working toward in expanding our soil moisture sensor network. Okay, so how does it work? Um, first, agents self-select to participate in the network and start learning about soil moisture sensor technology. The agents then recruit farmers in their area to try out soil moisture sensors. Um, agents are provided with sensor units purchased with the BMP mini grant funding, and we install those units on the participating farms. We then monitor the, um, monitor and discuss the data with the participating farmers and the specialists on the team. Both agents and farmers are in turn learning about the technology and how it can be used to modify irrigation. And the outcomes that we're working for include increased knowledge, ability, skills, and attitudes of farmers and agents, farmers adopting soil moisture sensor technology, and improved water use efficiency. Long term, the project can contribute to large, larger scale water quality improvements and reduced water use. Get to the next slide. Okay. The network was initiated in 2018 by Dr. Charles Barrett and other collaborating extension agents in North Florida. It has since expanded through Dr. Barrett's efforts, the work of our new specialist, Dr. Vivek Sharma and the many participating agents who sought out the technology for their clients. Funding has been provided primarily through the FDAX mini grant program. This is our most current extension agent network. 
and you'll see from the map that we have representation across most of the state. Uh, we have also partnered with the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Mosaic Company and Mosaic Foundation who are supplying 16 additional sensors. So next I would like to present Sean Steed who is gonna talk about a success story of sensor use at 1D Tree Farm. Okay, thank you, Yvette. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, we got you, Sean. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I worked with a, a farm, 1D Tree Farm. They're located in Plant City in Hillsborough County. And they're, they've got two locations. They've got roughly 25 acres of container and in-ground uh, ornamental trees. Uh, these guys come from a fish farming background. They're still doing fish farming, but they had excess property and they wanted to start doing trees. So they were very new uh, at, at the whole endeavor and really had, didn't have a feel for proper irrigation. So uh, they, they sought a lot of advice. Um, they had minimal um, experience with irrigating trees and they started uh, about year two, they started losing trees um, due to leaf loss and root rot and the saleable quality was, was going down. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So I, I, I brought this to their attention, the soil moisture sensor uh, to see if they'd like to, to try it out and they agreed. And we had a few objectives. One was to demonstrate the technology to them and for them to kind of see what was going on in the soil as they were as they were irrigating. Um, it's, it's a great visual uh, technology to see what is going on in the soil profile when you're irrigating. Uh, secondly, I also wanted to let them see the changes they were making visually and how weather was impacting their irrigation and, and what that would do to the soil moisture stat status. Uh, and, and like I said, visually, it's a, it's a great tool to, to see when, when you're making slight changes, what's going on uh, underground. And then thirdly was, was to get them to save those trees and modify their irrigation. Okay, Yvette, next one. So this is the, the when we installed the uh, soil moisture sensor, you can see this is, a, this is just kind of a chart and what you see is the profile of the soil and you can see the, the the moisture status. And you can move your cursor around on, on those dates and those lines and you can see the actual moisture content. But what you, when you see these large high peaks and these drop-offs, these very sharp drop-offs, uh, that's, that's over watering. And you can see that water moving, uh, let, even in the first, the first line, that first P, you can see it moving all the way down into like the 34 inch uh, or the 30 inch depth. And this, this was happening at every irrigation. So, so you, can, you can quickly see what's going on uh, when they're irrigating. Okay, next, next slide. And this is, a, this is after we, we looked at the technology and they had some, uh, some tweaks and modifications in their irrigation. Now you can see that, that main peak right there to the left, or I guess to the uh, September 22nd, that high peak, that's a rain event. But you can see their peaks now are, are gradual and it's not moving down very far into the, into the, 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 uh, the soil um, depth, and probably like maybe 14 inches, which is exactly what we want to just get enough moisture on that root ball to where the roots are and then preserve that, uh, those nutrients at that level. Okay, next. And then so, they, they really liked the technology. They really liked uh, seeing what, what was going on. And it helped them change and modify what they were doing at, at their farm. They quickly uh, were able to grasp how their irrigation was affecting the soil moisture status. And they were able to reduce irrigation by roughly 20% over that entire, both farms. Um, they also changed their strategy on how they were checking for leaks and plugs. They used to turn on the system for the entire farm and ride the farm. Uh, about two hours, an hour and a half, two hours, while they checked for leaks and plugs. And they saw how much moisture they were losing and fertilizer that was leaching into the system or out of the system. So what they, they did is now they're running sections during an irrigation event and just riding sections at multiple days so they can 
kind of conserve the amount of water they're putting out during the irrigation events. It also improved the quality of their trees uh, by reducing that, that amount of water. And they were able to recover a lot of those trees that were gonna be non-saleable in the future. They regrew their leaves and they, they, we were able to do soil um, drenches with fungicides and we turned those trees back into profitable uh, saleable trees. And I think next, uh, you got one more slide or is that? Yep, so next we're gonna have Lisa Hickey and I'm gonna check off. Thank you guys. All right, and Yvette, when you having the um, changing the slide, the actual selector is in the screen itself. So you might wanna like move the cursor or something. I don't know why I'm seeing it in the middle of the screen. Um, so I'm gonna finish up our talks with two of my success stories. And I have very shy farmers that don't want their face out there. So that's why I've actually used these smiley faces to protect the innocent. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna talk about fits some of those graphs that, we, that Yvette was showing earlier on why they adopt or don't adopt and why or why not they will make any changes. So next slide, Pope Citrus is one, my first success that back in 2017, he bought 30 acre citrus farm because he wanted to retire and do that as on the side kind of thing. And he reached out to me because he thought he had citrus greening and wanted to know how to deal with it. At that time, he was irrigating he had two zones. One zone was sandy and higher. One zone was loamy and lower. And he was literally irrigating eight hour events and then just alternating between the two zones. So in a 24 hour period, one zone was getting 16 hours of irrigation. And then as I got to talking to him, he was complaining about high diesel fuel bills and high fertilizer bills. So we put in a soil moisture sensor and he was not tech savvy at all, didn't wanna adopt any of this. I worked with him on looking at his iPad and how to read the lines and he slowly over a two and a half year period made some major changes. He then reported back some of his savings. So in diesel alone, he saved $45,000. And these are his numbers. Um, and I, I trust that they're accurate because of the changes that he made. And then also in fertilizer, he saved $8,000 in fertilizer. But look at how he changed after he put the soil moisture sensor in. He went to irrigating at one hour events in the sandy area, and he only did it twice a week. And then in the loam area, he did it up he ended up doing it every 10 days and at about the same period of time, about an hour, not quite an hour in that area. So he was iconic to what we wanted to see. Um, he since realized that citrus farming wasn't good for retirement and he sold his farm after all of these wonderful changes. Next slide. The uh, next farmer was Honeyside Organic Farm. And again, she did not want her photo out there. So Yvette, next slide. Um, we'll go through hers, another very small farming operation, 13 acres. And she came to me because she was getting very low yield. She was having a lot of pest pressure, particularly pathogens in her um, greens. Again, another uh, grower with probably some needed some education on irrigation. She had one zone for the entire 13 acres and she had all kinds of mixed needs. Not only that, she had a high dry area and a low muck area. So there, um, but she was doing equal to everything. She again was irrigating every single day. She was doing one hour intervals three times a day. Her last interval was at seven o'clock at night. So there was a learning curve there to understand when plants are taking up and needing um, water and when it's not. So we put the soil moisture sensor out. She was a little bit more sec um, savvy with the technology. So she picked up real quick on how to make changes. And we got her irrigation practices down to, she was doing it three times a week total with 40 minute interval um, um, per event. She uh, is now getting into a cost share so that she can put multiple zones on the property based on the soil types and the vegetables that are gonna go in them. And then she's also going to be putting a soil moisture sensor in every one of the zones because she loved the technology. 
last one, Yvette. Um, and so since I'm the end, I'm just going to say here is our team of agents that's in this network. And if you're shy and not sure you're ready to adopt and do soil moisture sensor training with your farmers and get them to do irrigation practices, reach out to any one of us and we'll talk to you. Each of us are starting to experience those success stories and they're awesome to share at a state um, level. So with that, I will conclude our presentation. Thanks, Yvette, Sean, and Lisa. Very interesting outcomes and uh, on the road to some really cool impacts there. So we're going to do the post. We've kind of run out of time. I don't see any questions in the chat, but we've got the post presentation poll up and Craig, if you want to work on pulling up your presentation. So our last speaker today will be Craig Frey, and he's going to talk about quantification of leaching across different irrigation management levels in tomato. Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna, Emily, can you pull up Craig's pre? Are you guys seeing the right screen or are you seeing the other one? We're, we're seeing your presentation screen, looks good. Okay. Let's just wait maybe uh, 15 seconds. We will, I believe, unless Craig has 50 slides and close to on time. And also assuming that Dr. Sharma does not have extensive concluding remarks. I don't think he oh, does. I don't. Okay. Well, we're gonna we'll be done by 1:15. Let's wait a few more seconds on the pre-survey. And again, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I have enjoyed listening to these presentations today. All right. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> Thanks for everyone who's been presenting so far. It's been uh, great to see the work that you guys are doing all around the state. Uh, again, my name is Craig Fry. I am the multi-county commercial vegetable extension agent um, for five counties down in Southwest Florida. And I'm gonna talk uh, about the project that I had um, and kind of also frame it like I usually do with, with growers. Um, some of it, I didn't know, didn't know exactly what the audience was gonna be, but uh, most of you know, uh, a lot about the nutrient and irrigation management and how they're connected, but I'll still go through some of that briefly and then get on to um, where we're going with it now. So um, first, I usually start with the fundamentals of, of nutrient management. Um, so we often talk about four R's, but really there's, there's five R's, the right rate, right source, right place, timing, and then irrigation. Um, and all of these are connected. And then I always talk to growers about goals. Um, <clears throat> I'm a goal-oriented person. I feel like if you have a goal, then you can um, evaluate it if you actually achieve it or not. So our, our goal is providing the nutrients that the crop needs, um, following these five R's so that we can, what is it? Is it to maximize yield? Is it to maximize our crop quality and yield? Is it to achieve the greatest economic return? Or is it to uh, minimize environmental impacts? And obviously it's some combination of these. Um, this is kind of what we're hoping that we're, we're going after here. Um, and so if we're, when we're looking at irrigation management, um, again, we know that that governs a lot of nutrient availability um, and nutrient movement in our soil. So it has the, the, the direct impact in our nutrient and water use efficiency, um, and therefore plays a vital role in uh, promoting water conservation and protecting our water resources. So as we looked at um, water management, I, I usually phrase as a, a function of two main aspects. There's the application efficiency. So the efficiency of our irrigation system as a whole, this could be whether you're doing seepage or overhead or drip, um, and also in, in each block, uh, what is the variation um, of the water output in those blocks? Um, so that's the application efficiency. And then there's also the different management levels. So how well are you actually managing um, your water in the amount that you're, you're putting out? And that's what the, the focus, uh, focus, the research is a little bit on both, um, but focus a little bit more on the second one here. Um, so let's then, uh, okay, so what is our goal in irrigation management? So we wanna apply the amount of water necessary to achieve 
our nutrient management goals. Um, and how do we do this? Um, it's by generally minimizing our crop stress. Now, there is sometimes early in the, the cycle where you might want to give them a little bit of stress to help improve the root system. Uh, but generally, it's minimizing our crop stress and then keeping our nutrients in that root zone. <clears throat> All right, so what are the different management levels that we talk about at IFAS? Um, first one is guessing. Um, obviously, this is not recommended and generally not anything. This is something that gardeners do, but not something that growers do. Um, then there's the C and, and field method that we had already um, heard about and see, saw from uh, Yvette's figures that this is what a lot of growers uh, um, do. Uh, there's also uh, using systematic irrigation, so kind of having a set schedule in what you're doing. And maybe that varies throughout the, the crop cycle, because obviously it's intuitive that your crop's going to need um, more water as it's producing fruit, depending on what it is. Um, but that's, that's the second um, water management level. Um, management level number three is using soil water tension measurement uh, tool or some soil moisture sensor to start your irrigation um, events. And so that would be looking at, say, this, the top line on this um, figure here in a sandy soil and saying, OK, when it gets to a certain point where our water uh, availability has been depleted and our roots can't suck water out of the soil, then we're going to turn it on. Uh, but then we don't really know what's happening from there, um, how far that water event is infiltrating into the soil. Water management level number four is um, having a little bit more of a combination. So having a schedule irrigation uh, that applies amounts based on a budgeting procedure and checking the actual water status. Um, so doing something like this, where you're just doing kind of site checks, uh, it's important that you have to do it at the exact same time every day in the same location. Um, so that way you have something consistent to go off of. Um, you could potentially say, okay, well, we have, this is our soil moisture current level. We know that field capacity is a certain amount and then we could calculate how much we need to add. Uh, but in actuality, growers don't really do that. Um, it's just more of experience over time and um, estimating on how much to add. And again, then we don't really know what's happening on that dynamic level of at different um, horizons in the soil. And then finally, um, the, the only water management uh, level that is recommended by UFIFIS is adjusting your irrigation to um, based on plant water use, so evapotranspiration, using a dynamic water balance um, based on budgeting procedure and the plant stage of growth, together with um, soil water tension measuring tools or soil moisture sensors. So obviously this is a whole lot more complex. Um, so let's go through the, the five main things for this management level. So all right, first, so we're targeting the crop water comments um, adjust to the crop stage of growth and the actual water weather demand. So we have our evapotranspiration. So this figure on the left is looking at um, down here in Immokalee uh, with a planting date, the day zero of September 4th. So that's um, <clears throat> based on a reference crop what the evaporative demand would be. Then you multiply that by the, the center figure, which is your crop coefficient. So for tomato over time, obviously, um, tomato by itself over time is going to have an increase in water use, mostly throughout, and then might drop off at the end. Um, but to know actually how much water your crop needs, you have to multiply these together. And that's how you get the third figure. And from this, you would see that um, basically a little over a month about 40 days into the crop, so half, less than halfway through the crop, is when your um, water requirements hit, hit the max, and then it decreases from there, which is a little counterintuitive um, for, for most folks. So we have what the crop needs. Um, then we have to make some adjustments based on um, what we see happening in the soil. So we, we've seen some other examples of what this looks like. Uh, we have to think about. Uh, a rule for splitting irrigation. So this hasn't really been talked about yet, but basically um, if you know your crop needs, um, say an inch uh, of water and, but your soil can only hold, where your root zone is can only hold in half an inch, then you need to split it so that you can get an inch early in the day. And then as it depletes, put another inch in. So that's basically 
the, the rule for splitting. Uh, we need to account for rainfall, so some way to, to measure that and subtract that from what we're adding. And then, of course, uh, record keeping. Um, <clears throat> so the goals of the study were to quantify the effects of three different management systems that are happening um, here in Southwest Florida um, in some of our commercial systems. So this was looking at management level number two, um, four, and five. And we were doing this um, based on a couple of things. So one, we were determining the number of leaching events throughout the crop cycle. Uh, we wanted to take in soil samples to evaluate the uh, available nutrients at, available at various points um, throughout the crop cycle. And again, that, was, that first goal then is focused on the management part. And then also wanted to kind of get some idea what are some of the constraints of commercial systems um, here in Southwest Florida, um, mostly extremely large systems. Um, and so in order to do that, we want to see what are some of these variations. So um, evaluating differences near and far from the pumping station. Um, is that a big variation? Is it pretty small? What does that look like? Um, and then also just on each individual drip line or some individual drip lines, what, let's get an idea of what is that variation. All right, so um, what happened in this season? Uh, I'm just going to be directly honest with you all. Um, I thought I had a good enough relationships to get buy-in from some of these growers. Um, I had actually only been on the job for about six months when I uh, put the grant application in, um, but felt some of these tomato growers were on my advisory committee. We had had a bunch of meetings um, and thought we could make this happen. I received the grant and then got in touch with, first it was the grower had that, that best management uh, management level number five, and they basically said no. They said, well, we've got these sensors already. Tell us what information you need. We'll see what of that we can get you and go from there. And so obviously that wouldn't really work for what this proposal was. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, worst case scenario, I'll have to write an apology letter to FDAC saying uh, this wasn't able to happen and would never be able to probably get <laughs> grant funding from them again. Um, and let's see what else I can do to eventually get some buy-in. And so basically, um, which it sounds like a lot of you all have, are doing in your respective areas, you're, you're meeting with these growers on a regular basis. Uh, I, I try to get on the far their farms as much as possible, communicating with them as much as possible, uh, just in other needs that they had. Uh, some of it was pest management stuff. And uh, through all that, basically three months later, we achieved the, the buy-in I needed from all the different growers. Um, so unfortunately, at that point, it was uh, too late in the growing season. Uh, it was beginning of this time last year, uh, a little bit probably towards the end of January, um, and missed some of the baseline data that I wanted. And one of the growers was done planting on their drip field. He was on his uh, seepage field down here and wouldn't provide that comparison I needed. So. Um, so then thankfully in talking with Lakesh and um, him corresponding with FDAX for me, um, they were gracious and willing to let um, this project basically be postponed to um, the following season. So this current season. Um, so this is this project is in process now. So once I got that, that go ahead, um, then I went and purchased the, the sensors and, and basically used them in the same way that you just heard from the statewide soil moisture network uh, folks. And so it was really late in the season. I, I got the sensors into a couple sensors each for four different farms. Um, and all of this, all of di a couple different crops, all of them were already producing um, fruit in the different crops that we put these in. Um, so really it was just to give them a chance to monitor, um, see what is going on, not really make any changes and go from there. Um, two, two of the farms, uh, I'm not sure if some of you has, have had uh, communication like this. Um, it was in Central Florida. It wasn't really down here. It was supposedly some through the uh, folks that I got the sensors from that had expressed interest in using them. Uh, but after installing on their farm, they didn't really communicate with me. They weren't, I wanted to have some regular meetings um, to help them interpret it, and that didn't happen. Um, thankfully, I was at least able to communicate with them and get the sensors at the end of the season. Um, the other two, we did have communication on a regular basis and wanted to kind of share some highlights from that. So the first was a, a fairly large um, multi-generation farmer. Uh, he purchased one single crop um, 
in multiple locations here in Florida as well as up the East Coast. So he's obviously super familiar with this crop from his expertise and not having to deal with various crops. Uh, again, he just was observing. Um, but since then, he has used probes at, at his other locations as he went um, up the East Coast uh, last season and continues to, to use them now. Uh, we haven't really tried to quantify anything yet, um, but are going to start doing that um, in the near future as one of my other colleagues is working more closely with him now. Uh, one of his comments, though, was that he was just astounded how much water he could save um, in some of the northern states, the mid-Atlantic area, as he you know, kind of took a little risk and skipped one irrigation. And then he, OK, well, now let me skip two irrigations and see what's happened, and, and was able to save a lot more than he was able, that he ever thought of. Um, the second was a, a diversified uh, small farm. So down here, a small farm is about 50 acres would definitely be a small farm. Um, and it was more of an industry research farm. So they're not really producing, um, their yields isn't what they live off of. Um, so they're doing different research and all they had to do was keep the plants alive. Um, after our first meeting, after we had them in the, the ground for a couple of weeks, the, the grower was like, oh, well, um, my, my finger is still the, the best soil moisture sensor I have. <laughs> So obviously, a um, finger can only go so down in the soil, um, and we all know um, what it can really provide. So <clears throat> we began adjusting management, um, and then later he convinced the company, you know, in an, just a few weeks to um, purchase multiple probes to be able to put out um, this season across this whole farm. Uh, looking at it a little bit, um, so these large peaks um, at the very beginning, and then the three other large peaks are rain events. The rest is all irrigation. Um, and you can see from the beginning here, he was doing five irrigation events a day. Um, so it was just a ton of water he's putting out. Basically, lower the lower profiles are just completely saturated. So you don't see bumps here, but it doesn't mean that water isn't going down there. It just means it was already saturated. So it can't really read anything higher. Um, if we zoom into here where we started some different management, um, you can see uh, at, at first he cut his uh, irrigation times and was still doing five a day. He was even irrigating at midnight, um, which if you know crop physiology, your stomata are closed, there's no evapotranspiration, plants don't need water then. Um, he went away on, uh, again, it's, he's not really employed to, to grow, um, produce for sale. And so he went away for the weekend and just put it on timer, came back and started cutting it down to three irrigations uh, events. And again, reduced from what he was doing originally. Um, two quick things to look at here, you know, from these two different rain events, one before he changed his management and one to after. Um, the first one, it was 10 different day, 10 days of irrigating um, from that rain event till we got it to kind of a somewhat suitable level. And so 10 days of leaching five times a day uh, through his irrigation practices. Uh, later on, after he changed things and we we're looking at these sensors, he had a, a rain event and it took one day to get back to that similar level. Uh, and so again, uh, didn't have all of those leaching events that he had previously. Uh, I briefly just kind of looked at <clears throat> these two different days here um, and just to compare, okay, what's going on with it? Um, and the amount, the increase in the, in the top two soil sensors um, was reduced by about 80%. So uh, I'm not really sure exactly how much water he saved. Um, we, he's going to work with me um, at the end of this current growing season to kind of use his pump data to say, okay, what was it look, looking like last year? What is it like this year? How much water did we save? Uh, but even if a a quarter of an inch was re reduced, which I think is going to be a lot more than a 25% uh, reduction. A quarter of an inch per week. Um, every four weeks on this farm, he's saved more than Olympic-sized uh, swimming pool, over a, a half a million gallons of water. Um, I think it's going to be a lot more than that. And so I'm, I'll be excited to report to you all what that has as we're able to analyze it at the end of this growing season. Um, so wrapping up quickly. Uh, Irrigation management, of course, is, is critical for achieving our nutrient management goals. Um, the goals must be uh, established in order to determine if nutrient irrigation management outcomes are achieved. And we need to understand um, the crop evaporative potential um, along with proper monitoring to be able to best 
practice um, irrigation management. And um, thank you. Uh, look, uh, thanks for FDAX for, for funding this um, trial that we're actually happening is happening this year and for BMP Logic for helping with the probes. Uh, and I look forward to reporting more on the actual results from the quantification of leaching potential across irrigation management levels in drip irrigated, irrigated tomato um, in the upcoming season. So thank you and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Craig. Um, we have one quick question from Lisa. Did your growers notice a change in yield? Um, so all of these were again, fruiting at the time that we put them in. So um, at that point, you know, they were really just monitoring it. Um, and so I'll, I'll have to, to continue to follow up with these guys um, this spring. Stay tuned for, for this yep. year. Yeah, yep. that's what I thought. Well, um, in order to fulfill my promise of finishing at 115, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sharma. And you, um, like y'all, like I said, though, if y'all have questions, you can reach out to, you know, the speaker directly, me or Lakesh, and we'll get your questions answered. Lakesh? Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, mo thanks for moderating this uh, uh, whole session. Um, uh, there are lots of people involved in the background when something like this happens, you know, uh, we... Uh, thank you so much for uh, helping us in, uh, in, in this uh, pre post test and thank you all the speakers for the wonderful presentations. I really enjoyed those, uh, especially um, in this uh, 15 minute it's, it's um, you know, to the point and, and, and exactly uh, what we really need, want to listen. Um, uh, with that, uh, thank you, FDAX, for continuous funding in the mini grant. I think uh, you are seeing a lot of uh, good success stories here, and I think uh, that that's the goal of this the mini grant program to fund agents. and And thank you, agents, for delivering these wonderful presentations, for uh, letting other people know, uh, you know, what kind of project we funded. There's a huge uh, uh, submission process, uh, review process involved. Uh, so it's, it's very important that you spend your time wisely on, on writing, which, which is very, very important part of uh, BMP mini grant. Uh, with that, um, if you have any question related to mini grant program for upcoming uh, year, please reach out to me, or Dr. Michael Dukes. Uh, we'll be happy to chat with you. Uh, uh, other than that, I don't have uh, many other words to say. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, the whole mini grant program is, is is doing very well. Okay, we have uh, not many questions. Michael, thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated in and gave presentations. They were great. This is Catherine with FDAX, and I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks to all the speakers. I have a feeling right. we're going to do this again. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's it's a very good. Um, sorry we missed two people pre post tests in the beginning. We did very well later on. <laughs> um, any questions, comments? Any Just a comment. Hi, this is Bonnie. Um, I really appreciated uh, the time you guys took to put this together. I really like the fifteen minute format. I know that it rushes everybody a lot, but it also makes everybody really kind of cut to the chase and present the most pertinent information. So. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Any, any I don't like tearful goodbyes, so I'm just going to say bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.